introduce Marie Ruel. Um, not that she needs much of an introduction in this group, but uh, I decided to use my two minutes anyway. So, In the fall of 98, 21 years ago, Marie came to Cornell to give the Field of Nutrition seminar. She presented the Ghana Urban Nutrition work in which she showed that good care practices mitigated the negative effects of poverty and low maternal schooling. At the end of her presentation, I asked a question, possibly my first as a new graduate student. Before Marie could answer, Jean-Pierre jumped in and said, Marie, what I think he really wants to ask is, <laughs> but <laughs> he didn't get much further than that, since Marie said, Jean-Pierre, let me answer the question. I understand his question. Finally, it had, I, had, I had found somebody who understood my questions. <laughs> Marie's contributions to the field of nutrition, global nutrition are impressive. Her research has often brought attention to topics well before most others in the field realize they are important. Marie has contributed significantly to developing and improving tools for measurement. Her work has played an important role in the current consensus on preventing malnutrition during the first thousand days. Her scientific work and her leadership have been instrumental in the current global focus on the linkages between nutrition and agriculture, nutrition-sensitive programs, on conducting theory-driven program evaluation research, and on the more recent focus on implementation research in nutrition. I want to take this opportunity to highlight three things that are more difficult to glean from scientific papers, characteristics that make her a remarkable researcher and colleague. My first point is about mentoring. Even though Marie has not worked at the typical academic institution, she has a remarkable legacy of closely mentoring young researchers who have grown to become senior researchers and professionals at academic and research institutions, donor institutions, and international agencies. One also does introductions at award ceremonies. Marie's mentorship, however, goes well beyond individual researchers. She was the first nutritionist at IFPRI and has mentored that entire institution to pay much closer attention to nutrition. My second point relates to research rigor. Marie has an exceptional and unfading focus on rigor in research. From writing proposals to finalizing a research paper, what you do has to be accurate, consistent, and communicate, communicated clearly and accurately. In addition, Marie is very straightforward and transparent. Combine the two and you know that when you share your work with her, you get useful yet unambiguous and honest feedback. What is most remarkable, however, and this is an important thing to highlight, is that Marie's candidness is never about raising her own profile. It is about making sure the work is done well and that it's relevant for nutrition programs and policy. My third and final point is a bit of a mystery. Marie is extremely busy, yet has time to actively listen, provide advice, and help find solutions. Her life appears in balance. I'm not sure how she does it. I suggest that it's something she writes up and shares with all of us. So, is a conclusion that, uh, of everything I've said that Marie is perfect? Almost. There is one area of nutrition research where Marie's reading of the evidence seems a bit selective. Anybody knows? It's about something that most of us would call a sweetener, but Marie would most definitely categorize as a food group. Maple syrup. <laughs> Occasionally, Marie refers to scientific evidence on the health benefits of maple syrup consumption. <laughs> I have not been able to find these articles, <laughs> and I would suggest nobody looks for them. <laughs> the good news is that maple syrup consumption is extremely low in the countries we work in, so the impact on the quality of her work has been very minimal. Please join me in congratulating Marie. I am, it's, it's such a great honor to receive this award. Um, I really never thought that I had the kind of background that could receive such an award. Um, and I'm particularly pleased because I'm joining a group of incredibly um, uh, accomplished 
experts and scholars in nutrition, and especially my advisor, my dear advisor, Jean-Pierre Habicht, who was the first one to win the award in 1994. So I'm I don't know, it just has a special uh, meaning for me to be getting this award today. What I will focus on today is my journey uh, with a focus on the aspects of my work that has been on, on program relevant research. Um, there's a lot of things that I have done that were not necessarily on this particular path, but this is the path that I was the most excited about and, and the most uh, motivated to, to go into. So I will take you through the journey on the, looking at first at the four big phases of my life and, and of my career. Um, and th these, these are part of the timeline of, of what I will be presenting. So it all started with my father who was diagnosed with diabetes in 1969 when I was 15 years old. And um, we, we went from a family of eating two desserts a day, homemade, uh, mind you, and a lot of maple syrup, as, uh, as Jeff said. <laughs> that was very apropos. And um, I still eat a lot of, of, of my own maple syrup, it's true. But, um, but we went from a family who was eating a lot of sweets and a lot of, of, of good foods uh, to a family that was counting calories, counting portion sizes, and had to pay attention to diets. So for me, it was really a transformation in my household. And I thought, well, I think I should just study dietetics. This is where you learn about nutrients and diets. And so I went to Laval University, and I did my undergrad. And then I did a year of internship at the Royal Vic Hospital in Montreal. And I practiced dietetics, and I really disliked it. And so I thought, what do I do? Um, I, I've done all this and I love the learning, but I didn't like the job. So I went to do my master's. I thought maybe I would see the light and I did see the light actually. And um, I met Jean-Claude Dillon, a French professor that probably not many of you know, who was, uh, he was a, he's a French uh, tropical medicine uh, pediatrician who was at Laval at the time, not for so long, but he was there and um, he, um, was, he had been working a lot in West Africa and was then working in Haiti. And so I, I went along and studied with him and he took me to Haiti and I did a work on, on riboflavin deficiency. Who would have known that I've ever worked on this? Uh, this has not been my career. <laughs> but, um, and actually I was really glad that my paper was in French so nobody could read it. <laughs> <laughs> or at least uh, I didn't want people to know about it. Um, so what I've learned from that was, of course, the challenges of developing countries. I had never been to a developing country before. Um, I learned about international work, international development. I talked with a lot of expats and people that do this work. And I got the, the kind of mission, the urge to do something. I, I, I didn't get the, the, the bug of, of doing more on, on riboflavin deficiency, but I, I'm... I got the urge to do something to make a difference, and that's kind of the beginning of how programs might do, might make a difference. And even after that, I was still wondering what I should do, and um, what do you do with a master's in nutrition and in international nutrition with an experience in Haiti? So I um, decided that maybe I should do a PhD. There was no longer a Jean-Claude Dillon in Laval University. There was nobody to teach uh, international nutrition in Laval University. And so I talked with Micheline baudry darisme who was then at Moncton University. She had been a student of Latham, of Michael Latham at Cornell. And she said, well, how about you visit Cornell University for a semester? Just go see, you know, if you like it, you might meet a lot of people there. Um, and so I did. I went. Uh, there was a, a joint program between uh, SUNY University and Laval University. And um, she said, you know, you should really meet Michael Latham. He's, he was my advisor. He's the best. He's fantastic. And there's also this other professor that he, who is there who is also really great, but he's kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> you all guessed who it was. Jean-Pierre, dear Jean-Pierre, was uh, um, almost a love at first sight, if you want. It was the professor I wanted to learn from. And um, he did ask his question on the first time I saw him. 
so where do you want to be in 10 years? And I was like, I really don't know. I have other things to think about right now. But he's asked that regularly. I could never answer that question. So I don't know if this was the aspect of him, though it's scary. But anyway, it didn't scare me away completely. So I joined Cornell, and I stayed. I not, did not do just a semester. I did a whole year of classwork, and then, of course, work. And then I uh, was offered to join the joint UNICEF Cornell Nutrition Surveillance Program, which was a, a program, as it says, joint between a Cornell University and UNICEF. And uh, so the, the light bulbs that you see there are all the people that have been important for me. Uh, they are luminaries that have influenced me. Uh, Jean-Pierre is, I have to say, the one that, that has had the most incredible impact on my thinking. But all of the others really did contribute a lot as well. And so there, there's a lot of luminaries in, in, uh, in my presentation. So at the time, John Mason was director of this joint program. David Pelletier uh, was in this program just about to go to Malawi. And Victoria Quinn was our contact in, in uh, UNICEF in Eastern Africa, in, in Nairobi. And that's David at the time, with his lovely daughter, Jennifer. Um, so I went to Lesotho. I didn't even know where it was before I went. Uh, and uh, the, the task there was to evaluate which growth chart the, the, the government of Lesotho should use in, in Lesotho because they had a lot of growth monitoring programs uh, at the time. Uh, growth monitoring and promotion was not, the promotion part was not invented yet. So it was just growth monitoring chart and everybody was weighing children and measuring children. And um, they did not really know which one was best. And you can kind of see from the two that I highlighted there, it was pretty obvious that the left one was really a lot easier to understand, but they wanted to have an answer based on evidence. So I was asked to answer that question, and at the same time, I could do my research for my dissertation. Um, and what I learned from there, from, from, from this, or what struck me as, as um, really a, a part of my learning was that, first of all, we worked with the government of Lesotho for the whole way through. From the beginning, they had the question, we discussed how we were going to evaluate, and, and, and so it went on and on. And at the, at the end, of course, they, they adopted the chart happily. And we, we write in our paper, the use of information from applied research such as this is fostered by involvement of national decision makers at all stages of the research process. I thought this was beautiful, and I'm sure those were jean pierres words. I was not that enlightened at the time, but I think it's still something that, that was very important for me. And what I learned was um, that program implementation is really challenging. And uh, what best lab to learn about program implementation constraints than growth monitoring? A lot of you know how I feel about growth monitoring, so it's no surprise that I'm, I'm putting the emphasis here. But this is a beautifully designed program that could do a lot, and it just doesn't work. It doesn't work at any stage along the way. Everything goes wrong. So that's what I learned. And um, I also learned that uh, poor quality data, that this kind of exercise was, was providing poor data quality, that people were using for purposes that were not right. The data were, were centralized, sent to the national government, and, um, and then they would make decisions about where are the malnourished children. But those data are not representative, so they, they couldn't be used that way. And at the end of the day, there was a very limited use of data for action at any level. And so this was sobering in many different ways, but it also continued my bug for we need to do something to improve implementation of, of programs. This is a, a brochette of people, some of you are in the room, that I studied with in Cornell. And we met many years later to celebrate, I'm not sure what anniversary of Jean-Pierre and Gretel or something. <laughs> Um, and so this is just to show some of my colleagues from the time. I, as actually, yeah, the, the third phase uh, was when I joined INCAP. Uh, after my PhD, I joined INCAP 
Uh, again, Jean-Pierre influenced me a lot. He wanted me to go to NCAP. This is where he had uh, worked. This is the Institute of Nutrition of Central America in Panama. And I had, you know, possibility of jobs in Canada versus NCAP. And for him, it was a no-brainer. And I, I agreed, and I was, I'm so happy that I went. Um, I, uh, the, uh, the director of NCAP at the time was Hernan Delgado. Juan Rivera, my colleague and friend from, from the, the PhD, was director of the Division uh, of Nutrition and Health at the time. And uh, when he left, I became division director of, uh, for, for that uh, division. And Reynaldo was the director of the Oriente study. A lot of you probably have heard about the Oriente study that was conducted in Guatemala. And at that time, they were just uh, doing the first follow-up. Uh, and I will explain in, in a minute. This is another set of really uh, pretty distinguished people. We met for the Oriente study uh, in, uh, in Bellagio, and um, I wanted to just show the, the incredible people that worked on this project. It was just such a fantastic atmosphere of, of uh, learning. And I learned about growth, I learned about body composition, I learned about early child development, and I wanted to emphasize that uh, Patrice Engel and Ernesto Paulet was in, were incredibly important for me in my development to learn about, about early child development, and we missed them. Um, that was uh, the, the fun part of Bellagio. Um, and here I will pause for a minute. Lots of pictures. It looks like a scrapbook. But um, I, I'll <laughs> what I wanted to convey is that I will explain uh, some of the, the, the issues that, that I want to talk about are related to the Oriente study, but I want to mention that I did a lot of other things when I was at INCAP, and I, I enjoyed uh, all of the learning again. We had a um, linkage, um, linkage pro program, I think it was called, Ken would know, uh, between University UC Davis and INCAP. Um, and I got to work with Kay Dewey, Ken Brown, and Lindsay Allen, and this was a completely different type of learning, but I really enjoyed every minute of that part of the work as well. And um, I also um, hosted a lot of students from the US that wanted a little time in Guatemala or that were doing some research uh, for their PhD. And here I just have a few of them. Uh, Benedict de la Brière, who is now at the World Bank. G Gero Carletto, who is also at the World Bank. Uh, France Bégin, who's at UNICEF. And Lynette Neufeld, who is here. <laughs> And, and at gain. <laughs> and um, I also highlight uh, the, the, on the right side, um, Omar Dari, who I think is here, uh, and Ruben Grajeda, and uh, Eric Boy, who were in my division, because I did take over, as I said, the division, and they were in my division uh, at INCAP at the time, and now we're all here in, in Washington. Those were great times, very vibrant INCAP. So, uh, what I want to highlight here is how the evidence from that famous Oriente study uh, was used in a lot of the evidence for the policy change to go to the first thousand days is coming from the Oriente study. In, in that sense, this is a study that provided most of, of what we know uh, about why invest in the first thousand days. So for those of you who don't know the Oriente study, that would be the people under 30 years or something. <laughs> um, this, and if you've if been to Cornell, you would still know it, even if you're 10. Um, but um, the Oriente study was a nutritional supplementation study. There were two villages that were randomly assigned to receive a nutritious atole kind of drink. And you see the little boys uh, drinking their, their drink there. Um, and it, it contained energy, micronutrients, and protein. And the other two villages were allocated to receive a drink that was more, that was called the fresco, that was more, uh, that contained only the, the same micronutrients, but no protein and no energy. And mothers during pregnancy and children all the way to seven years of age were invited to come and, and consume the drink as much as they wanted, as often as they wanted. And the, the study was conducted in the late 60s, early 70s. So, um, and we were, as I said, at the first follow-up when, when I joined uh, INCAP, and the children were in adolescence or so. So the first thing that um, I worked on with Jean-Pierre on this was um, analyzing the data and realizing that when we target interventions, when we target um, 
programs to different children, we usually use a risk approach. So we use association studies and we say, okay, this thing is associated with the outcome we want to change, so we're going to target based on, on, uh, on, on, this, on the risk factor. But what we did in this analysis was to show that actually the, the predictors of risk and the predictors of benefit are not the same. And so if you want really an impact from an intervention, you should, you should use indicators of benefit and not indicators of risk. And I have to say that I continue to see a lot of analysis of risk and, and wanting to intervene in those that have these risks. And actually, in the Orienticity, among others, they were not the same. So that, one, that was one of very important uh, thing for, for me, anyway, to understand. And in that particular study, what was the greatest indicator of benefit was age. Um, you probably have seen this slide, but the, uh, the Orienti study was offered, as I said, to children up to seven years of age. And here you can see that those who benefited in length were all those who had received the supplement before they reached three years of age. So they, they, those who started after, at three or over did not benefit. Uh, this was a paper written by Dirk Schroeder with many of us. And those impacts that we see based on benefits at three years of age persisted to adolescence. So that really strengthened the, the case for the, the th first three years. Uh, and this is Dirk Schrader, who was a magician for birthday parties with children at the time on, on his uh, spare time. Um, I'm sure my girls remember him. Uh, <laughs> so um, the other point was that we were we were learning, really, um, that um, uh, I remember doing these, these um, looking at the Oriente data and doing these graphs and thinking, oh my God, there's more than 20% of the kids are stunted at three months of age. So we're coming in way too late with our interventions. They're already stunted at, at three years of age, and, at three months of age. <laughs> And, and then we got it. The children were born stunted. The children had r growth retardation in utero. So all that was, was really making it very clear that pregnancy in the first three years are, are important. Now I'm jumping, I'm skipping to another time frame because that's the other element of this flow uh, that brought about, I think, important evidence for the first thousand days. This is the, the, uh, the study that we did in, in Haiti where we got a chance to assess the impact of targeting the first thousand days, but then really the first thousand days until two years of age, so during pregnancy all the way to two years of age. And we compared that with the way that food aid programs were usually uh, targeted. In, in those days, food aid programs with maternal and child nutrition inputs and all of that were always targeted to children once they had become malnourished, that, that is, it was underweight, uh, children that were underweight, less than uh, minus two standard deviation from, from, for, for weight for age. So once the child was, was, wasted, was underweight, the child was in the program for six months or so. And so we compared that model, which is the blue bar, with the preventive model, which was this blanket targeting. And, and you can see that there was uh, an impact, there was a, a difference between the two. And those who, who were targeted with, with uh, the first thousand days, actually had better nutritional status at the end. They were still pretty stunted, but there was um, better nutrition. So this program was proved to be better than the recuperative. It's no surprise to us now, but at the time it was a really big deal because food aid people did not want to change the way they do things. But also imagine how much food it is if you give food during a thousand days versus oh, for six months for that child. So they could, they could cover a lot more children before, but they didn't have any impact. So, you know, if you, if you think about the, the impact, uh, this is more important. I wanted to highlight uh, our wonderful team here. Um, again, Jean-Pierre with the Gretel Pelto were, were with us in, in that journey. Pernima Menon was leading uh, the field work and, and, and was very active in this project. Cornelia Lersch, it's, it's a pleasure, Cornelia, that you made it today, uh, was in Haiti and, and leading the, the whole project. Wonderful time. And my husband in the back, who was with Fanta at the time. And, and our, our counterparts, our partners, wonderful partners from World Vision and, and, and other people that we hired for the project and from USAID. Um, so uh, I don't want to spend time on, on the first thousand days, but I just want to say that for me, this is such a great example of 
using evidence for policy and, and of also the way that for once the nutrition community has been able to mobilize itself and, and agree on something. And, and it has had a tremendous impact, not just in the nutrition community, but I can see in the work, in my, in my work with the CGIAR, with the, the ag, ag people, and, and all of the, the research centers that we work with, how much impact it has had, because it, it's, it's just everywhere that we focus on the first thousand days. The downsides, the first one, of course, is that now we're neglecting the other age groups. Uh, I think there's a lot of people who feel that way, that now the children two to five, there's nothing for them, and we have to think about them. Um, there's a, miss, a missed opportunity that we continue to miss, is to work with the early child development community. Uh, the thousand days is equally important for ECD as it is for nutrition, and we still don't work enough together, to my point of view. Um, and I think Jeff has probably said that, that there is a problem with the fact that the thousand days and stunting have been bundled together. So especially for the non-specialists, and, and I, I can say in agriculture and all that, if they think a thousand days, they think they have to improve uh, stunting, to reduce stunting. So that, that's a, another downside, but we can, we can figure those out and, and resolve that. Um, so, if pre 23 years of my life, and I'm, uh, I'm I don't know, 20 minutes into my presentation, <laughs> um, but those days were very special, the past days were very special. So here, um, Lawrence Haddad and Pear Pinsir Pendison uh, hired me. I'm not sure that the picture is really what Lawrence looked like when he hired me, but this is an old picture of him that I found. Um, they hired me and then they both left after a little while and, um, and Joachim von Braun came on board and he convinced me that I should take on the, the directorship of that division and he said, why don't we go nutrition? And I was like, yeah, right, you know. Um, and Schengen has been my, my director general for 10 years. The first condition that I had when I became division director was that I was managing a lot, many more economists than nutritionists. And so the first condition that I had was to have a deputy director. First time in, in history of, of IFRI that there was a deputy director, but I was given John Hardenad, who was, or I selected John Hardenad, who was a fantastic uh, um, deputy director. And, uh, and now I have Dan Gilligan, who nicely came tonight and, and is another fantastic um, Deputy Division Director, and I'm, we're not seeing it, but he's wearing a, a what, a Batman t-shirt on the, a Superman, sorry, you know my grandson always says I can't differentiate between Superman and Batman, this is really bad. Um, the other thing that was wrong with, uh, with IFPRI when I came, as uh, Jeff mentioned, I was, the, I was not the very first ever nutritionist, but I was the only one when I joined, and so I said, well, I need to hire some uh, nutritionists. And in the middle of the left picture, the, the, the smiley guy is, is Saul Morris, who I hired uh, as a postdoc in 1997. And uh, he was smiling, he was happy. Uh, and then that same year, I had two uh, interns in the summer in 97, uh, Pernima Menon, that you can see on the, on, on the left side. I had to fix her, she was invisible, so I, I cropped her in. Uh, <laughs> But she was there, um, and um, and Simon Barquera, who is now well, who who has gone back to Mexico. But uh, those were the days. So many fun people. You can see on the right side, Jeff as a baby, and uh, uh, Lynette also really young, and all of us really young. Um, so anyway, those were really great times. So when I came to. Um, to IFPRI, I was given the task of uh, developing a program on urban food security and nutrition. And we did that. We had four case studies, and I led uh, a couple of them. And this one is the Guatemala uh, daycare center uh, or in, in urban Guatemala that I led. And the only thing I wanted to highlight from that uh, was the fact that this was uh, another similar uh, situation as in the uh, Lesotho case that the government, the government didn't come to us, but we went to them and we said, we, we think you have a fantastic program there. Could we evaluate it, please? 
And they said yes, but they didn't really care about the impact. They wanted to know how the program was, was working. So it was a program where mothers were, were taking care of 10 children in their house in really, really poor neighborhoods of Guatemala City. So you can imagine that a lot of things could go wrong in there. And a lot of things did, but they wanted to know, they were honest about it. And so we did, um, with Benedict de la Vrière, who is there, um, this was the first time I published a, a process evaluation, but we really had to figure out a way to do this. We, there was no guidance. Uh, I was looking at an old operational research document from the core group or something, uh, even now before the core group, PRICOR, I think it was called. So this was really something that I had to invent, and, and it, it was very challenging, but it was the results were fantastic, and, and they, they were very happy to get our recommendations on how things could be improved. Um, so now I, what I want to talk about is how we build our nutrition sensitive research portfolio. So you all know that this is something that IFPRI has done, uh, is to do a lot of work on, on nutrition sensitive programs and how we did that is, is what I want to highlight here. Uh, I'll take the example of, of uh, nutrition sensitive agriculture or agriculture and nutrition, but this is really not the only area where we've done nutrition sensitive work. We work a lot with the economists on, so, on social protection programs. We have Harold here who has worked a lot on, on ECD as well, early child development. We have lots of people that work on food, uh, school feeding and, and things like that. So. Of course, agriculture and nutrition was not new when I came to IFPRI. You see on the left side the gray, um, the, the publications of IFPRI were not that shiny in the past. And so uh, that was a, a, a 1980 something publication. And uh, it was probably Pear, I can't read, but I think it was Pear, Pinster, Panderson, and, and a lot of people worked in this area. But they were using nutrition as an outcome. That was it. You know, agriculture must be important for nutrition, so we're going to measure and we're going to conceptualize. Um, but we wanted to fix that. Nutrition is not just an outcome. For anybody, it should be just an outcome. Um, so, first of all, we defined the pathways of impact. That was really important because everybody had done some work on, on pathways of impact, but but we, we just couldn't make sense of those multiple pathways that, that looked like spaghettis that, that people were looking at. So we simplified the pathways to six or seven, and we, we educated people about it. We have here um, a guidance document that was produced and has been used a lot, especially by, by agriculture pe uh, people who want to know, okay, I want to improve, uh, improve nutrition through this. I'll choose the, the income pathway or I'll choose the uh, women's empowerment pathway. And um, I had the opportunity to also, uh, I just wanted to highlight to, uh, as part of our educating and then building capacity, and uh, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in a learning session with Melinda Gates. I was pretty honored to know that she was interested in learning about this. Uh, uh, Shelley Sun Sun Sunberg and, and Laura Burks had invited me to uh, participate, and they had organized the session, and, and I thought this was really nice to be able to talk to people that uh, can, can have impact and to maybe uh, help them shape their ideas about the importance of agriculture for nutrition and also the critical role of women uh, in this nexus. Another thing that we did is develop indicators. indicators uh, really help because then you have something to measure uh, the concept that you're trying to talk about. And once you have those indicators, we can see that they're talked about a lot more. And in this case, I have to say, uh, this is a paper that was led by Mary Armand, and, uh, w which was looking at, uh, at the, the relationship between dietary diversity and nutritional status. I don't think this is something we should do <laughs> so much anymore, but what struck me is how much this paper has been cited because it, it had an indicator and it was looking at the association with nutritional status and people have used it a lot and, and so it made it to the 90th anniversary collection in, in the Journal of Nutrition as one of the papers that was read extensively in, in its category. So um, develop indicators and, and use them and make people use them and, and you will have your papers read um, and, and advice, a piece of advice. Um, the, the, the fourth thing was uh, the conceptualization uh, and, and the opportunity, again, that the Lancet series on maternal and child nutrition gave us to work on a paper that allowed us to think through 
what is it nutrition sensitive, how does it work, what kinds of interventions do we have, what are the opportunities that are missed and all of that. So I worked on this paper with Harold Alderman. And here are the authors. Um, <laughs> In, on, on, on the right side uh, are Bob Black, Zulfi, and, and myself, and we had reserved a seat for Stuart, who was the first author of the fourth paper, but he wasn't there. Um, and, and Harold, I wanted to mention, uh, is, uh, has been selected this year for the Foreman Lecture. So uh, this is on June 27th at IFPRI, and it will be video streamed and will be uh, available on video as well. We filled the evidence gap, or we, we contributed to filling the evidence gap. This is a very big, important point, thing to do when you want to bring up an issue. Uh, so we did a lot. We are still doing a lot of large evaluations of nutrition-sensitive programs. And I'm, I'm citing here the one that Diana Olney wrote, which, uh, th this paper that Diana Olney wrote on the Burkina Faso work as the first one that was uh, a, a randomized controlled trial. And I wanted to emphasize that we have been able to do these nutrition sensitive e program evaluations largely because we've had such good implementing partners. Without them, we cannot work. And, and Ellen Keller has been our longtime favorite because we've worked with them for a really long time. And here you have Victoria Quinn and then Sean Baker, who, was at, who were both at Ellen Keller when we started this work. And they were such great supporters and they wanted the learning and, and the research. And so that, that's just one of many that we work with, but they are certainly worth highlighting. Another thing that's important in terms of getting, uh, getting something on, on the table is that we, we really made an effort to publish our methods. We have methods paper on evaluation of multisectoral programs. On the left side, we have two from, uh, one from Rahul uh, Rawat and one from Purnima uh, from the Alive and Thrive work. And on the right side, Jeff Leroy and, and Diana Olney wrote other papers. So we wanted people to learn from, from our experience and to learn by also trying to use our methods. And so publishing the papers on that was important. And then, of course, more reviews, more synthesis, because the, the field changed so rapidly. I felt that in 2018, we already had, uh, I think, 47 more new, new papers that we hadn't reviewed in, in the Lancet series. And, um, and I think the important thing here also is that, uh, in, in this case, I uh, co-authored the paper with Agnes Kisumbing, who is our guru in, uh, in gender and who was very instrumental in, in bringing in this paper all of the aspects related to the importance of women's empowerment and the evidence that had been gathered at the time. So one of the things that I also wanted to mention is that when we do that, we eventually sometimes contradict ourselves. I recommended, I don't know how many years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I was a strong advocate of saying agriculture and nutrition should be focused on the, ch on the young children. If you want an impact on something, you should really focus on the first thousand days. And now I'm saying, well, it's not a good idea to make agriculture responsible for fixing stunting by itself. So we should uh, make agriculture do what they're good at, focus on food and focus on good diets, improve access of, of households to, uh, to, to foods that are nutritious, but, but you don't need to put, you shouldn't put agriculture responsible for improving stunting by itself. And then if they want to work multisectorally, which is a whole other aspect, then maybe they can get there. I'm almost done now. It's going to be a lot of pictures of a lot of people, and, and I'm, everybody who's on my, my who's had have their picture on my slides is someone that I want to thank. So all of those who have who, who we've seen so far, but then there's a few other things that I want to mention about how we worked at, at IFPRI is so different from the way that academia worked that I thought it was worth emphasizing a little bit. So we work in teams, and on the left side you recognize Jeff and, and Diana. Uh, we, this is our team uh, for one of our food aid program in Guatemala with Mercy Corps. On the right side, you have an Alive and Thrive team with uh, Rahul, of course, and, and Purnima. 
uh, and, and all of our, the rest of our team, Sonny Kim and, and Fuang. And what I wanted to emphasize here was uh, Ellen Piwas, whose, uh, whose vision when she started with all of us on, on Alive and Thrive was that she wanted this project to be a learning project. And, and, and she put a lot of emphasis and a lot of money on the learning part of the project. And she was very supportive of the research in spite of some, uh, some others that were ne less committed to continuing to fund the research and the learning. So, uh, that, that is an important model. Um, Agnes Kisumbing that I've talked about is on the right side of the left, uh, left uh, picture. Um, and then you also have Neha Kumar who works with us and, and, uh, and Pradima. There's Carol Levin on the right side. Carol was working with me on urban uh, food security and, and malnutrition at IFPRI a long time ago. Uh, Shalini Roy is, is with us, and, and you have Cornelia again, and Purnima again. <laughs> um, we also have country teams. The importance of our country teams is that they are closer to the action. They certainly are closer to the stakeholders and, and the policymakers, and they interact more with them. And so we feel that we can have a lot more direct impact with having these country team. Uh, Jeff is now leading the West Africa team. Rahul was leading it before. Um, in India, Purnima is leading that team, which, is, uh, which keeps growing. Many uh, people are here, have presented posters. This is a very active team in, in research. And our Bangladesh team is led by actor Ahmed, who is on, on the right side. And this is our biggest team. We have like 35 people in, in Bangladesh, and we have incredibly good relationships with the government and different ministries. And I think the, the continuous presence of, of IFRI in Bangladesh has resulted in a lot of policy impact that we're very proud of. Uh, this is my senior research staff. I've talked about all of them so far. There's six of them. And they really are the pillars of the, of the division. They, they are the, the influencer, they are the fundraisers, they are the program manager, the, the mentors, the leaders. So I owe them this award <laughs> and, and all of my staff. The division was like a dozen of people or so in 2009. And, and the last retreat, there were 51 people present, but there's actually 90 staff members in the division. And my creative assistant and, and garden angel, Nicole Rosenweg, uh, designed this slide because I said, I want a way to have all of them on one slide, and they're all there. And then I also wanted to mention Lineta Spilera, who has been my administrative assistant of the division since I joined IFPRI. She was there way before me. The co-authorship has shifted, but I wanted to guess who is my, uh, the, uh, the person I've written the most with, Pernima. I have worked with her since 1997, the second in Jean-Pierre, and then Fuang, because Fuang is so productive. She writes so many papers with everybody. Uh, Rahul, you're there, Jeff, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, influence at IFPRI, uh, we used to cater donuts and cakes and, and uh, big, big cookies uh, the, the American way. And now we have an advocate in Schengen, our, our director general, who really keeps saying we need to eat healthy, nutritious, and sustainable foods. And we do. And the picture on the right is uh, uh, Jamed Falik who helped me with these slides, thanks to, to him. And Melissa Cooperman, uh, I wanted to thank her. She is somewhere in the room uh, doing a video of the, of the lecture. So if anybody has missed it, uh, you can tell them. They can see the, uh, the video. And um, this is my fantastic family. You all, I'm, I'm going to start being really. <laughs> so I'm going to leave you with that. They have accompanied me the whole way. Thank you. Thank you.